God has spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by hand to bring them out of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, although I was their husband. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel in those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. They shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. I will cleanse them from all the guilt of their sin against me and I will forgive all the guilt of their sin and rebellion against me. And so it came to pass, as Matthew tells us in the beginning of his gospel, behold, an angel appeared to Joseph saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so the promised time arrived, the time of God's appointing, the time when one is born who bears the Lord's anointing. We sing our first hymn on the screens. As we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. 
Lord, we join with joy and gladness the song of unnumbered angels rejoicing in the message of the coming of the Anointed One, the Lord of heaven and earth who came as promised with power to save, to save us from our sins and to lead our feet into the path of peace, our sins forgiven, our past cleansed, and our future also secured through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of God is here, so full of truth and grace. God's glory is disclosed upon a human face for us and for our salvation. Help us, Lord, we pray, to understand the joy of the Christmas message to understand it afresh today so that we might know you, O God, our Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let me welcome you all very warmly to our fellowship this morning, very especially if you're visiting with us. We hope you'll feel at home and very much part of uh, our church family here. We don't have notice sheets out today, but uh, we meet this evening not for our uh, usual uh, service at 6.30, but uh, we gather here from 4.30 onwards so that we can go out in groups, uh, three large groups, we hope, into the city center to sing carols and then join together, as we always do, on the concert hall steps uh, to sing for those going by and then uh, to come back here for uh, mulled wine and tea and coffee and mince pies and so on afterwards. So do come and join us. Uh, from 4.30 onwards. Uh, you may think the weather's a little iffy, but uh, the BBC weather forecast says from 5 o'clock it's going to be dry. <laughs> so if that promised time arrives, we shall be rejoicing. I can't say I quite have the same confidence as I do the prophet Jeremiah, but there we are. Uh, we'll, we'll hope for the best. Uh, Christmas week is upon us. On Wednesday, uh, we meet for our lunchtime carol service uh, a little earlier than the normal 1.15, we'll be singing carols from 1 o'clock, so do come along uh, if you're able. Then on Thursday, of course, uh, Christmas Eve, we have our candlelit service uh, from 5 to 6 at, uh, uh, in the evening. And then, of course, Christmas Day at 11 in the morning. And then next Sunday, we'll meet as usual on Sunday morning at 11, uh, but we have no uh, evening service uh, next Sunday evening. So our young ones are in with us this morning. There is a crash, and uh, there will be a Sunday school for the eights and unders and uh, the little ones can go out a little later on uh, when we're taking up our offering. But uh, we want to sing lots of uh, hymns this morning, so we're going to sing our next one now, which I hope will appear on the screens. When God from heaven to earth came down on Christmas Day. And uh, if you'd like to take up your Bibles and turn to page 856, uh, Nathan Alexander is going to read to us from uh, this part in the beginning of Luke's Gospel, chapter 1.
And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give us light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Mercy he has shown us, joy to all the world, for us God sends his only Son. Hallelujah. services uh, this year, we're asking the question, why was Jesus born? And uh, we're seeking the answer from those uh, closest to the events uh, and those who were given by Jesus himself, the inside track, if you like, the definitive uh, interpretation of the great events of his life, what it was all about. That is the, uh, the inspired writers of the Bible, of course. And that's where we find, not speculation, but God's own authorised interpretation of what the story of Christmas is actually all about. Not my idea, not your idea, uh, not the idea of your school teacher, who in fact may be very ignorant about all of this, although they may be able to teach you many other useful things. No, today's message is summed up really in that one verse that we read earlier on from Matthew chapter 1, that Jesus came to save his people from their sins. And you'll see it, I hope, on the screen there. You see, we saw that um, Zechariah's testimony at the beginning of Luke's Gospel was this, that at last, salvation, long promised by God, will be made known to his people. How? In the forgiveness of their sins. Jesus Christ came into this world to save us from sin's dreadful penalty. Now you see how this is announced right at the beginning in chapter 1 of these gospel books. 
Because it tells us that Jesus came into the world to deal with the greatest, the direst need of all human beings. Every person since the beginning of human history. And the problem, of course, is that people don't always know what their greatest need in life really is. That was true in Jesus' day. In their day, they were uh, looking for a saviour, the Messiah, that's right. They were longing for him. But many of them thought that their greatest need was to be liberated from the Romans, from political uh, oppression, uh, from uh, economic uh, exploitation, and so on. And, of course, lots of people today still think that these are the greatest needs in the world. Many people think that that's what Christmas is about. It's about a message of goodwill and uh, seasonal cheer and charity events and Christmas cards and all sorts of things where, with a touch of sentimentality, we want to make the world a bit of a better place. But no, that is not at all what the angel of God wanted to speak about to Joseph at that first Christmas. Now, his message was that none of these things at all are the real problem. Not oppressive Romans, not dictators, not terrorists or ISIS, not climate change, not poverty. None of these things. The really big problem in this human world of ours is something different. It's a problem God says you have with me and a problem I have with you. Because this is my world, says God. And what in my eyes really matters is your sin, your guilt, and your rebellion against me and my rule in this world. That's what you need saving from, the penalty of your sins. Now, Israelites of all people ought to have understood that. They had God's law telling them everything that God required and, of course, pointing out to them how far short they constantly fell from what God required. And so Israelites ought to understand sin better than anybody else on the earth. Just read the Old Testament. Read the book of Leviticus alone, for example. It's all about endless sacrifices again and again and again, all year, every year, just so that the people could go on living in the presence of God and not be judged immediately for their guilt and sin. Endless repeated sacrifices to stave off God's just judgment. Now, of course, those sacrifices were a great blessing, weren't they? Because they knew that if they trusted God, then God would count it as if the blood of these bulls and goats were their blood. And he would look on these as as if their sins were being borne away by these sacrifices. But of course, at the same time, it was obvious to everybody that the blood of bulls and goats couldn't really deal with their sins. No, of course, it just reminded them of their constant sin. And it drove them again and again to trust God's promises that one day, one day at last, somehow he would do what he had promised, deal with their sins completely and thoroughly and forever. As he had said he would right from the beginning. And all down the ages, God's promises to do that never faded away. In fact, they got stronger and stronger and clearer as time went on. And the prophets spoke more and more of a day when at last God would make a new covenant, as we read. A covenant never to be broken when he would forgive them once and for all the guilt of their sin. We read that in Jeremiah. I remember the prophet Isaiah who promised that a son of David would come at last to rule forever on the throne. He'd be a promised servant who would somehow bear away the sins of his people and so count many righteous because he would be bruised for their iniquities. He would be wounded for their transgressions. And so he would sprinkle them clean And sprinkle many nations, said the prophet, cleansing them and saving them from their sins forever. And now at last, in the coming of Jesus, the promised time had arrived. At last, the one who would bring this promised forgiveness came as the promised saviour. You will call his name Jesus. Yeshua means salvation. 
because he will save his people from their sins. And we're told all this is to fulfill what was spoken by the prophets. He will be called Emmanuel, God with us, to save us from our sins. The birth of Jesus Christ is all about a promised forgiveness that now at last is coming to pass according to promise in Jesus Christ. Well, we're going to break and sing again as we take up our offering and as the little ones go off to their classes. Hark the glad sound, the Saviour comes, the Saviour promised long. We'll stay seated for the first couple of verses as the offering comes round and then uh, we'll stand and sing the last verse together. up your Bibles again and open them to page 1006, Hebrews chapter 9, and uh, Rachel de Bleak is going to read to us uh, from that chapter. Under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered, not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood not his own, For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all, at the end of the ages, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Do keep your Bibles open at Hebrews 9 there, because what that reading from Hebrews 9 tells us is not only that Christmas is a promised forgiveness from God our Saviour, but that it's about a forgiveness made perfect in Jesus Christ our Saviour. Christmas is about a perfect forgiveness. 
And the Apostle is looking back at the events uh, that the Christmas story began. And again, he's explaining it to us with full apostolic authority. And he tells us that through the birth and the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he has achieved forever a perfect forgiveness for his people. And the whole message of that letter to the Hebrews is that in Jesus Christ we have God's finished work forever. It's one of the great words of the letter. It is perfected and it is perfect. That means nothing else is needed for our full forgiveness. Nothing for God to do, nothing for us to do, but to receive what Christ has done. And that's wonderfully crystallized in this uh, passage that Rachel read for us that speaks, if you look at it, of three appearances of Christ for us. First of all, look at verses 25 to 28, especially verse 26 should be on the screens there. Christ's work has secured a perfect forgiveness because first it has secured the past. Jesus is not like the Old Testament priests who appeared in the temple year after year to put away our sins by the sacrifice uh, of the bard of bulls and goats again and again. Now look at the screens. He has appeared once and for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 28, Jesus has been offered once to bear the sins of many. That means it's done. God has achieved in Jesus a work of lasting, permanent forgiveness. And so the next chapter of Hebrews 10 goes on to say that by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And where there's forgiveness of sins, there's no longer any offering for sin. You see, all of these sacrifices of the Old Testament, they pointed forward to this reality. And now in Jesus, it's fulfilled, it's finished, it's perfect. And uh, the Hebrews writer quotes several times the words from Jeremiah the prophet that we read at the beginning. Because it's a perfect forgiveness, he says, I will remember your sins and your lawless deeds no more. It's a perfect forgiveness. The past is secured forever. And that means that there's nothing more that needs to be done. Nothing needs to be added for you to know perfect forgiveness of your sins by God. In fact, to think that uh, you could somehow contribute something to that is actually to insult God terribly because there is nothing that we could contribute to such a great forgiveness. But the Hebrews writer says in chapter 10 that if we think we can do that, we're, we're trampling Jesus underfoot. We're treating as profane the blood of the covenant that saves us. We're insulting uh, the spirit of grace. People find that so hard, don't they? Because um, it's hard to grasp that, that forgiveness comes to us as something that's already perfect. That something is, is coming to us just as a sheer gift of God's grace. That there's nothing that we have to do because we want to do something. We want to add something. Sometimes we think, well, we, we need to add something like penance or or confessions, or some kind of noble works, or something like that. That's why, uh, that's why Roman Catholicism as a religion is so attractive, because it gives you the chance to do something, to add something, to do your part, to have all these religious practices. But it's wrong. You see, if we think that, that we can add something to what God has done for our forgiveness. It just shows that, that we really haven't begun to grasp how great the problem of sin actually is and how enormous and how infinite is the work required to forgive that sin. Sometimes people say, well, it's because I feel so guilty. I want to do something. I want to do something to atone, to make up. The truth is, actually, we don't feel nearly guilty enough if we really understood the weight of sin, we would know that we could do absolutely nothing 
to move that vast, crushing, damning weight of God's anger and God's just penalty against us. But look what it says there. Jesus appeared once for all to put away sin by his perfect and sufficient sacrifice of himself. He's put it all away once and for all, as far as the east is from the west. And the Bible says because of that, God remembers our sin no more. It's a perfect forgiveness. Our past, however guilty it is, however shameful it is, it's secured once for all because of what Jesus came to do. And that means, that, as Zechariah sang, you can be at peace. It means nothing can haunt you from the past. Nothing. No failure in your life. No lack. No great evil that you've committed. It's the knowledge of that forgiveness and that it's totally accomplished that can lead your feet into the path of peace, as old Zechariah sang. You can do nothing to make up for your past sin, but you don't have to because Jesus' forgiveness has dealt with your past and he's dealt with it forever, once and for all. But that's not all. If you look at verse 28, you'll see again Jesus' forgiveness has secured the future. He will appear a second time, we're told, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Jesus, once for all past, the work that he has done in history forever secures also our future. And the Christmas message, therefore, guarantees everything that is still to come for this world and for our lives. And when he returns, he will usher in the fullness of his salvation to save ultimately and forever those who are waiting for him. See what that means? It means that if you know Jesus Christ, whatever your fears are for the future, you needn't fear. You needn't fear anything for your future life. Nothing at all. Not for your daily needs. Not for your job, for your family, for your pension, for where you'll live when you're old, for your body, how you'll cope when you're old and decaying. You needn't even fear for your physical death or for the judgment that lies beyond death. Because Jesus' death for sins has secured the future forever. There's no guilt in life and there's no fear in death for those who know Jesus, the Savior, who has perfectly forgiven our sins. Because we have a great high priest who's gone through the heavens to lead the way for us. And he's coming back to lead us there, to lead us safely home. It's a natural thing, of course, isn't it? Especially when we get older. It's a natural thing to fear for the future. We fear aging. And we fear death. Death is a real enemy. It stalks every single one of us. And at Christmas time, that's very especially true, isn't it? At Christmas time, perhaps above any other time. We're so conscious, aren't we, of loved ones who are no longer with us. And the grief's very fresh and real, isn't it? And we can think about ourselves and think, well, how will I cope? How will I cope when I get older and weaker and frailer? Well, you see, the gospel says, well, don't look inside to yourself about how you'll cope. It says, look back. Look back to the once and for all appearance of Jesus to deal with sin, to deal with its dreadful penalty, not merely <coughs> physical death, but, but everlasting death. He's done it. And it says, it says, look forward to his certain appearing again and rejoice that the perfect forgiveness that you have in Jesus Christ means that you can face that future with a steady eye because you know the future is secure in Jesus Christ. And you know that not even your own sin and your own folly and your own stupid, stupid mistakes can undermine the perfect work of Jesus Christ, your Savior, for your salvation forever. 
That's a reassurance, isn't it? When you're often foolish and sinful, and when you do stumble so badly, constantly. But Jesus' perfect forgiveness secures the past and guarantees the future. And actually, there's even more still. If you look at uh, Hebrews 9 and verse 24, Jesus' forgiveness secures, he says, every single moment of our present life and existence. It's not that, it's not that this is all just some, some sort of remote thing in the past and something that we sort of long for as being far away in the future and, and we're in limbo in the middle with nothing at the moment. Look at that verse 24. He is appearing for us now in the presence of God on our behalf. And that means that Jesus' forgiveness is at work now, today, every day, every hour for those who belong to him. He is today a merciful high priest, just like us in every way and yet without sin. And therefore, knowing our human flesh, he is able to intercede for us in our weakness. And he does so constantly, all the time. Maybe you're feeling rather weak and, and needy today. Well, Hebrews 7 verse 25 says, He is able to save those to the uttermost who draw near to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Always. Not that Jesus has to do anything more today on behalf of uh, of, uh, uh, on behalf of us before God. Jesus interceding doesn't mean that. It's that his perfect finished work, his blood continues to speak peace for us day after day after day. And so that that ongoing power guarantees that we have intimate fellowship with God himself and access to God himself in a never-ending constant way. Nothing can undo His perfect work of forgiveness for us. And therefore nothing, nothing can prevent us from drawing near to our Heavenly Father in perfect peace. With our conscience cleansed. As pure as the driven snow. Even though this very day we know that we have done things that ought to separate us from God. He ever lives And he appears now in the presence of God on our behalf to bring us to God. So nothing can stop us coming near to him. Christ's finished work secures our present as well as the past and the future. And that means we know that we can be at peace with God no matter what. And our path can be the path of peace today. And every single day because of what Jesus did. And so we don't need any priests today. We don't need any mediators to bring us to God. We don't have to pray through the saints or anything nonsense like that. We don't need some special worship leader in church to sing special songs to draw us into God's presence. We don't need any special rituals or any confessions or anything like that. No, Jesus' forgiveness is perfect forgiveness. Yesterday, today, and forever. It's the same. And it belongs to us. If he is indeed our Lord and Savior. That's what the message of Christmas is all about. And no sin and no failure today can ever separate us from our Heavenly Father. Or tomorrow, or the next day, or the day after that. Or ever. Because he's appearing now on our behalf and therefore he's proclaiming a perfect forgiveness for our sins and so as we sometimes sing that means when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within which is real I look to heaven and I see him there who made an end of all my sin because Jesus came as a savior from sin's dreadful penalty. He was born as the promised savior and he is risen. He's interceding today with a perfect salvation. And thus rejoicing, free from sorrow, praise his voice and greet the morrow. Christ the babe was born for you and for everyone 
who trusts in his name and who calls him Savior. Well, before we think of one last thing, we're going to sing again from the squalor of a borrowed stable, a hymn that speaks of how Christ went through the uh, stable to the cruel cross and now is at the place of highest honor on the throne, interceding for his own beloved till his father calls to bring them home. Just uh, before we uh, conclude this morning, I want to pick up on something that's very, very important and that many of the Christmas carols uh, speak of and allude to. Christ the babe was born for you. Because, see, the message of Christmas is not just one uh, of promised forgiveness uh, by God the Savior and, and perfect forgiveness made complete uh, in Jesus Christ and his saving work. Because the truth is that all of that would actually remain meaningless for you and me unless we see the implication of it all, unless it comes home to us, unless it becomes real, that we realize that this is a forgiveness that is promised and made perfect and must become personal and can become personal and does become personal even for those who are the very worst of sinners, the chiefest of sinners, the foremost of sinners. Listen to some words uh, written by the Apostle Paul as he speaks very personally about what coming to understand the message of Christmas truly meant for him. He's writing to Timothy, and he says this, Formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, 
of Jesus Christ, he means. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. You see how personal all that really is for the Apostle Paul. Jesus didn't just come into this world in the past in some kind of uh, abstract way to deal with sins, as though sin was some sort of oil slick floating around in the world that needed to be dispersed and put away. No, he came into the world to save sinners, human beings, people like us. And he came to save us from the personal guilt of our own personal sins against God. He came to bring personal forgiveness. And that once-for-all work in the past to deal with sins forever and to secure the future of peace with God and life everlasting, that is something that he imparts personally to real people, people like you and me, people in the real world today. And uh, in the present real experience of men and women and boys and girls the world over, that is what is happening today when they hear the message of the good news of Jesus and when they respond with loving trust to the very personal call that he gives in his gospel to them to be their savior, offering himself to us as just that. And that's what makes Christmas gospel, good news, not just interesting news, not just true news, not just historic news, but good news, personal news. Christmas isn't just like Remembrance Sunday. It's not just looking back at something which happened long ago and, and, and respectfully acknowledging it, commemorating it. No. Jesus is a savior from sins today, for real people today. And Christmas brings a personal message to those who will receive that good news today. Good news, says Paul, even for the foremost of sinners, the chief of sinners, as he calls himself. And he had good reason to call himself that. He was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor of God's people. He was an insolent opponent. He was ignorant, he says. He was unbelieving. He, he murdered people who were following Jesus Christ. So great was his hatred. And yet he received mercy and forgiveness of his sins. Maybe some of you have got friends and loved ones who seem to fit that kind of description that Paul had of himself. Maybe they wouldn't use those words. But they blaspheme, they hate, they want nothing to do with Christ, they're ignorant. And we tend to think, well, there's, there's no hope for them. Maybe some of us here this morning even feel, well, actually, that is fairly close to where I am. I'm, I might not use Paul's language, but yeah, that fits me, my attitude to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But look what happened to that vehement, determined, vicious opponent of Jesus Christ, that hater of Jesus, that scorner of the church and its message. I received mercy says Paul. The grace of God overflowed to me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that extraordinary? I think by any, any account, that extraordinary change that took place in that man, Saul of Tarsus, to become the great apostle Paul is absolutely astonishing. But that is why Jesus came, not just for Paul, but for anyone the world over who receives the good news of Jesus Christ because he came into this world to save sinners, 
to make forgiveness and peace and reconciliation with God possible and personal, supremely personal. Look at verse 16. He says, it, it happened to him he received mercy so that as the worst of sinners, God could display in him his unlimited patience as an example for others who likewise would believe in him and receive eternal life. What he's saying is that the, the depth of the grace and mercy of God that can bring forgiveness to this man, violent, blasphemous, murderous, if it can do that, then there is no one on this earth for whom the forgiveness of God in Christ cannot become real and personal and wonderful and utterly life-transforming. Not your scornful, disinterested husband or wife or son or daughter or mother or father or friend not your, your friends at work who want nothing to do with Jesus except to scorn his name and, and blaspheme in his name. Not anybody here in this building this morning who thinks that because of what they've done, they must be far too far gone for any of this to be possible for them and they could never be at peace with God again. No, you're wrong. Look, this saying, verse 15, is trustworthy. It deserves full acceptance. You must accept the truth of this. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, even the foremost sinners. Jesus Christ was born to save, calls you one and calls you all to gain his everlasting whole. Christ is born to save. That's what we sing in the Christmas carols. To save from sin's dreadful penalty, from the guilt of our sins before a holy and just and perfect God who cannot look upon sin. He came to bring forgiveness, full and free, and the knowledge of salvation that alone can lead our feet, can lead our lives into the path of peace, both in this world and forever and ever. Long promised this forgiveness long promised down the ages by the prophets, but made perfect forever in the work of Jesus Christ the Savior and made personal today, right now, for everyone who will receive that forgiveness through trust in the name of Jesus Christ and Him alone. The perfect man, incarnate God, who by selfless sacrifice destroyed our sinful history, all fallen Adam's curse. In him, the curse to blessing turns, our barren spirit flowers, and o'er the shattered power of sin, the cross of Jesus towers. That's the joy, that's the wonder of the Christmas message, of the Christmas miracle, and it is a miracle. That in our Lord Jesus Christ, we have a Savior from sin's dreadful penalty. And we have a future forever with Him in a life that never ends. So, friends, this Christmas, don't just listen to the story of Christmas, wonderful as it is. Grasp hold of the message of Christmas which is a personal message from God above to you, if you will receive him. There is in Jesus Christ forgiveness, past, present, and future. An end of darkness, the birth of light, and the beginning now of a life that will never end. Because he came into this world to save sinners, even the foremost. And that must include at least every one of us in this place this morning. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we thank you that in the place of our sin, we have the light of the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So help us, we pray, this Christmas, amidst all the celebration and all the earthly joy, May our ears and our hearts be open to the message from heaven of sins forgiven and of life everlasting.
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, our last song makes known that wonderful mystery made known to us. Oh, what a mystery I see, what marvelous design that God should come as one of us, a son in David's line. So now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.